teaching elder here at the way and uh, i'm so glad to see you here this morning as we begin our new sermon series entitled challenged titled challenge we finished up first john uh it took us a couple of months to get through first john and so we're going to do something a little bit different in the month of november uh and hopefully you will be as edified as I was edified by our study through the book of 1 John. <clears throat> Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, that God's ways are not our ways. And amen for that. God's ways are higher than our ways. God's ways are better than our ways. God's ways are different than our ways. God's ways are completely opposite of our ways. And so as we progress in our faith and we become increasingly acquainted with God's ways and we increasingly seek to follow God's ways, we ought to be challenged. We ought to be challenged in our faith. If you are not being challenged in your faith walk, there is a problem somewhere. Either you are not studying and reading about God's ways, or you are not hearing God's ways, or you are ignoring God's ways. But there is an issue somewhere if you are not being challenged in the faith. And so my prayer is that this month we would, in fact, be challenged as we preach through one particular verse. And we'll get to there in just a minute. So this month we're going to preach about living a life of missional obedience. Living a life of missional obedience. Maybe you've heard it said you're going to be on mission. I hate to even use that phrase. I hate to use the phrase on mission because the Western church is just so destroyed and twisted and distorted this idea of being on mission as if you could somehow be off of mission. And when we talk about being on mission, sometimes I think that Jesus wouldn't have any idea what it was we were talking about. And when he looks at the things we're doing, he wouldn't have any idea what it is we were doing. There is one mission. It's the great commission that he has given to us. As if we could somehow relinquish that commission. On June 3rd of 1995, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. What were you doing in 1995? I'm just kidding. On June 3rd of 1995, I was commissioned. And for the next 20 some years, I served in the United States Army. And there was never a time when I was not an officer in the United States Army based upon that commission. Now, there was a time, there were times when I acted like I was not in the army, an army officer, but I was never not an army officer. I was always on mission. My commission persisted just like the Great Commission does. So we are going to speak from one verse, the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. One single verse to guide us through the month of November as we talk about living a life of missional obedience. Living a life of missional obedience. If you have a copy of God's Word, you can flip to the book of Acts chapter 1. Uh, and it will also, I believe, be on the screen. So let me set the scene. So Jesus is crucified, dead and buried. He rises from the dead. And over the course of 40 days, he appears to many different folks. And he speaks to them and he says different things to different people over the course of this 40 days. And including giving the, the great commission that we just spoke about, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 28. At the end of Luke, when Luke speaks about the great commission, his version that he communicates of the great commission, he tells them, Jesus tells them that you will begin in Jerusalem. You will begin in Jerusalem. Hold on to that thought as we get to Acts chapter 1. So Jesus comes to them in Acts chapter 1, and he tells them, don't stay, or don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait here for me. He says, wait right here in Jerusalem. I don't want you to go anywhere else. 
And then he comes to them and, and they ask him, they say, Lord, it is now the time you will restore the kingdom. They, they still don't understand. It's understandable why they still don't understand. Uh, but they, they don't. And he says, well, it's not time for it's not for you to know these times uh, that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And then he says to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He tells them, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He's talking about Pentecost. A couple of days from then at Pentecost, that's exactly what happens. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon him. They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Until that point, there was a separation between their salvation and their baptism in the Spirit. But now we know, Scripture tells us, as I am saved, I am simultaneously baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I am equipped by the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the church, for the building of the, of the church. He has given us those gifts. That is the power that He has given us to us to build up the church. And we see that happen at Pentecost as reported in Acts chapter 2. But then His commission to them is He says, You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You're already in Jerusalem. You will be my witnesses right where you are at. And then He says, You're going to be my witnesses in, in Judea. That's the province. That's like maybe Montgomery County to Clarksville. He says, you'll be my witnesses there. And then he says, you'll be my witnesses in Samaria. Who, who is Samaria? That, those are the people that they hated. They had a reason to hate them, but they hated them. Whether that reason was justified or not. He says, you will be my witnesses there. And then you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. What is the principle here? Is that the, the, the literal rendering that they should only go to those places? Nowhere else, just Judea, just Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And it, no, there's a principle there that we abide by, that we can take from that. And we've got to be careful when we allegorize the text. But the principle here, the principle is rooted in the sovereignty of God. That you are exactly where you are in life. For a very specific reason, because God has specifically placed you where you are for such a time as now to be a witness. And you don't have to go all the way around the globe to fulfill the Great Commission. You can, and by all means, if God is calling you, go. But right here in Jerusalem, where you are now is where your mission lies, your fundamental mission. And we can talk about a lot of different aspects when we think about being in Jerusalem, where we are now. We can talk about our family. We can talk about our co-workers. We can talk about our friends, our, our extended family. But we're going we're gonna to focus like a laser beam today in the first installment of our series talking about living a life of missional obedience and we're going to talk today about what the Word says about the fundamental obligation and duty of fathers and mothers to make disciples of their children. Their children. I'll make a couple caveats here. Uh, we have some, some younger folks here that, that may not have, or that don't have children yet. Uh, Statistically speaking, you likely will at some point in time. I mean, most people have children at some point in time. So, you know, maybe think, well, this doesn't apply to me. Uh, or maybe you're older and you don't have children yet. Or maybe you can't have children. Or, or maybe at some point in time, or maybe you're not going to decide to have children. You don't feel led to have children. And that's okay. It's between you and the Lord. But just because it doesn't specifically apply to you, so later in the month we're going to preach about foreign missions. And so I may not be called yet to go be a foreign missionary. Does that mean that the text, the word, does not speak to me in that regard? I don't have an obligation to be a part of that call? No, that's not what that means. And so the caveat there is that I believe this word is for all of us. Now we come in one of two conditions to this idea. Uh, the first condition maybe we come is in a condition of ignorance. We don't know what God's word says concerning the obligation, the duty, the privacy, the urgency with which fathers, fathers 
And mothers must make disciples of their children. So maybe, maybe we come because we don't know what God's word says. And I pray that we will destroy that idea today. Or, or maybe you know what God's word says. Maybe you know how clearly God's word speaks to this issue, but it's still a struggle for you. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as well today. And I think we'll see that scripture well affirms all of these things. So let's get let's get this party started. So we got to go back to the garden. We got to start in the garden. All things always got to go back to the garden. So God in, in the context of the Trinity says, let us make man in our own image. Let us let us make man, and he created them male and female. And then his very first command to the couple, to the couple, was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. God's first command to the couple was to, to the man, he says, to the man, to, to know his wife in the strictest biblical sense of the word, and to have children, and to make disciples. And this was God's original revealed plan to populate the earth with God's people was for parents to make disciples of their children. That was the original revealed plan in Genesis chapter 1. But what happened? The fall is what happened. And the fall twisted and distorted everything. Uh, it severed all relationships between men and God, between men and one another, men and women, between men and creation and because of things like, the, because of the fall, we have things like children born out of wedlock. We have children born without fathers. We have children born into situations other than the original revealed plan, which was for children to be brought up by a mother and father in the context of discipleship. The original revealed plan, the fall distorted and twisted all of that. But the fall did not abrogate, the fall did not eliminate or abolish the plan. The fall in no way eliminated the requirement for parents to make disciples of their children. If anything, it added urgency, great urgency to the plan. Our children are born as rebels against a holy and righteous God. And they have but one hope. And that is the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus. I think of my little guy, Max. I mean... That's why I have this on my nose, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, he, he took a, practically a two-by-four and whacked me across the nose as I was walking down uh, the sidewalk in downtown Clarksville the other day. Uh, he's three, and I think he's like, the, I mean, I know I'm partial to him, but I think he's like the cutest thing that there is. I mean, I just look at this guy, and I, he's rotten, too, man. He just, <laughs> he's so rotten. I love him. But little Max has no hope of heart. From the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus. And he is counting upon me. He is relying upon me to communicate that to him with urgency. So let's take a look through scripture and see how scripture well affirms the call upon parents to make disciples of their children. Let's go to the law. Let's go to the law. We'll go from Genesis to the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, right away, he says that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. Right in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, he's already making provision for our sons and for our son's son. And then Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, this is that the Shema. The Shema, this great Hebrew statement of faith where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What a, what a, great, what a great verse that is. But have you read on from that? He says in the very next verse, You shall teach them diligently to your children. we got to teach this to our children. And then he goes on to say, you, you talk about them all the time. Talk about it while you're walking around, while you're sitting down, while you're laying down, while you're eating. I used to have this misplaced conception of discipleship that, that it was something you did. Okay, it's, it's time for discipleship now. Everybody come, but we're going to do discipleship right now. And, and then we'll do discipleship for an hour. And, and then we'll eat dinner after that. And that's how I used to think discipleship was. This verse says no. That's not discipleship. Discipleship happens all the time as, as the gospel drips out of my mouth with every single interaction I have with my children. I am discipling them all the time. When we sit down, when we eat. 
When we're walking around, when I'm tucking them into bed at night, I am making disciples of my children. That's what the law tells us here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go to the wisdom literature. The mandate for parents to make disciples of their children is all over the wisdom literature. And I'm talking about the Psalms, the Proverbs, other places. And so many of those was tough for me to pick. But Psalm 78 tells us, Psalm 78 he says, I will open my mouth in a parable and utter dark sayings from old. Things that we have heard and known. And where do they know them? These are things that our fathers told us. Our fathers told us these things in verse 3 of Psalm 78. He says, we will not hide them from their children, but we will tell to the coming generation. What will we tell them? The glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He did these things. He established a testimony. He appointed a law. He commanded our fathers. He commanded them to teach their children. Why? That the next generation might know them, children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. And why? So that they should set their hope in God, verse 7, and not forget the works of God. We teach our children these things. We make disciples of our children that they would set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. We see it all over the wisdom literature, Proverbs 22, 6. Bring up a child in the way of the Lord. When he's older, he will not depart from that. Now, we know that that's a principle. I mean, there are children that do reject the teachings of their parents. That happens. But in general, Scripture states it. Reality bears it out. In general, children inherit the faith of their parents. Their fathers, really. Their fathers, really. Children inherit the faith of their father. They inherit the faith of their parents. This is from the wisdom literature. Let's go to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. My favorite book of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, six chapters and for three chapters. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Paul states this great doctrinal truth. He talks about the doctrine of predestination. He talks about the doctrine of election. He talks about the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, through grace alone, for three chapters. And then the last three chapters, he says, well, because of these great doctrines of God, because of who God is, this is how you act. This is how you conduct yourself because of who God is. And it's interesting that almost all of the, the second half of Ephesians is about relationships. This is how you relate with various different people in your lives based upon who God is. And listen to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, the words of Paul. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Don't provoke your children to anger, fathers. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. From the Apostle Paul, we ought to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We ought to make disciples of our children. And we see an example of that in 2 Timothy. Timothy was discipled from the youngest age. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14, he says to Timothy, As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, Knowing that you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred scriptures. Timothy is an example. He, he was born to a, a, a Jewish mother who became a Christian. He had a Greek father and his mother taught him the sacred writings from the youngest age. And when he was older, Paul prayed that he would not depart from what he learned as a young man. Are you convinced yet that scripture gives primacy to the duty, the obligations of fathers and mothers to make disciples of our children? That this is fundamental to us living a life of missional obedience. <clears throat> Why is that the case? And again, scripture bears this out, but it's affirmed by reality that the most effective evangelist. The most effective evangelist is a loving, engaged father, bar none. Nothing else is even close. Children inherit the faith of their parents, their fathers, really, or lack thereof. Lack thereof. And what we also see is that when children grow up, after they leave home, if they leave home not of the faith, 
Statistically speaking, they will never be of the faith. There are very few adult converts. I'm one, so there's a few exceptions when it comes to that. But in general, there are very few adult converts. And here is the reality of the situation. If you are not making disciples of your children, somebody else will. And they probably will not be making them into disciples of the risen Lord Jesus. They might just be making them into disciples of the prince of this world. I'm talking about Satan. They're disciples of somebody. Are they going to be disciples of the risen Lord Jesus? And what do we focus on? Think of the things that parents focus on. Think of the things that, 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 that dominate our child raising. Are you as concerned about the spiritual health of your children, of your sons, as you are concerned about their academic health? I mean, I got it. He's got a 4.0. He's a valedictorian. He's, he's, going to, he's got a full scholarship to Harvard. He's going to be a Rhodes Scholar. He's going to be a rocket surgeon. He's going to be something like that, something academic. I got it. Does he know the risen Lord Jesus? Are you as concerned about the spiritual health of your child as you are concerned about their athletic performance? About how they perform on the fields of friendly strife. I mean, I got it. He's a, he's a great athlete. He's a, he's a letterman. He's got a scholarship to Austin P to play football. He's going to go pro. Does he know the risen Lord Jesus? Does he know the risen Lord Jesus? I had Memphis is a, is a pretty good athlete. He's probably the, one of the better athletes in our family. And he was playing baseball a couple of years ago. And, and he's, a, he's a pretty good baseball player. And this man came up to me after practice one time and kind of pulls me aside and he hands me a business card. And he's like, he's like hey, uh, take him to this guy right here. He's a swing doctor. He charges about 120 an hour, but, uh, but he'll, he'll, he'll help us swing out. And I'm like, 120 an hour? This kid's playing Little League. And, and I'm going, I mean, would we invest that much in his discipleship? In his discipleship? Are you still not convinced? Well, let's see what happens. The scripture gives us a great example of what happens when men, fathers, and mothers do not focus upon making disciples of their children. The book of Judges, chapter 2, we'll just take a quick touch point here. So Joshua leads the conquest. He leads the invasion of the Holy Land, and, and he's not... The, the people are not faithful to fulfill God's call, to complete the conquest of the Holy Land. At some point, they lose heart. They, they, lose, they lose heart for battle, and they become content. Uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just take what God has given us thus far. We don't, we don't want to complete what God has told us to complete. We, we've got enough land. We'll just take this land, and we'll, still, we'll just let these wicked people live with us, even though God ordered us not to do that. They, they, they became content with that. So Joshua gets old and dies. Chapter 2, verse 10 tells us what happened. <clears throat> and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. One generation, one single generation, and the people of God fell away from the Lord. The fathers of Israel. The fathers of Israel. We're not diligent in making disciples of their sons. Is the bottom line what happened. And within one generation, the people fell away. And it tells us in chapter 3, verse 7, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God. They forgot him and they served the Baals and the Asherah. That's what they did. Psalm 78, where we were, continues to say that they should not, we should teach these things to our children because we do not want them to be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. We got to teach our children these things because we don't want them to be like us. We don't want there to be a falling away. And that's exactly what we see today in this country. Is we see a great falling away from the faith. My, uh, my generation and older, my generation particularly, I am a member of a generation that is first generation unchurched. I am first generation unchurched. My parents were raised in the church. My, my, my mother was a Lutheran. Uh, my father was a Methodist. Uh, kind of an eclectic blend there and and we dabbled we dabbled in the church early in my life 
You know, I, I went to youth group a time or two. We, we went on Christmas and Easter some, not always, but eventually we abandoned the church completely before I was really a teenager. And, and so I am first generation unchurched. Today's generation, millennial generation and younger, are second generation unchurched. Second generation, they are two generations removed from the church. They were not raised in the church, and their parents were not raised in the church. And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, why that matters is that changes the narrative. It changes the paradigm with which we must communicate. I think of uh, earlier this week, I got to listen to a, a pastor speak to us, and he was talking about uh, doing some ministry out on the West Coast, you know, the left coast. <laughs> And uh, he spent 10 years in Washington State planning a church. And he was telling us about what that was like, planning a church in a state, Washington State, that is a largely godless state. And he recalled this one particular instance where he was uh, talking to this young lady, she's like 18 or 19, and he's telling her about the crucifixion. And this young lady is bawling. Like she's like over, and she's not overcome because of, uh, like, you know, when I think about the crucifixion, I get overcome. She's, she's, she's bawling because she's never heard about the crucifixion. And she couldn't believe that people would be so cruel to this man, Jesus. She had heard of Jesus. She knew that there had been a man named Jesus but that was about the extent of her knowledge. And when she heard about the crucifixion, she was shocked by this. This isn't Iran. This isn't Saudi Arabia. This is the United States, where we have perfect liberty to communicate the gospel of the written. And there's a child out there that did not even know about the crucifixion. He said that was not the only conversation. He had lots of conversations like that. But you know what? He's been in Clarksville for four years planting a church. And he said to us, you know, he talked about he was comparing his experiences here in Clarksville and his experiences out in Washington State. And he said, you know what the difference is? Do you know what the difference is between Washington State and Clarksville, Tennessee? And he said, nothing. I noticed no discernible difference in the overall spiritual status of the general populace between Clarksville, Tennessee and Washington State. This, this bastion of godlessness right here in the Bible Belt. He noticed absolutely no difference. Sure, there's a few more people here in Clarksville, Tennessee that are deluding themselves that are attending church periodically and saying they are of the faith, but he noticed absolutely no difference at all between Clarksville and Washington State, because the bottom line is there has been a great falling away that continues with each generation. And so what do we do? We pray for revival. We pray all the time, God, please revive us. Please revive the church. Revive this nation. Revive us, God. Do this, that, and the other. But I'm here to tell you today that there will never be revival apart from fathers and mothers having a passion to make disciples of their children. Maybe that's too strong of a statement. God is sovereign. God can revive as he sees fit. But I'll, I'll change my statement. We'll amend that just a little bit. What I will say is the surest way to ensure that there will be revival is for fathers and and mothers to make disciples of their children, to see what scripture tells us about this, to see the primacy of this mission, the urgency of this mission, the legitimacy of this mission. But that's not how we roll today. That's not what we do today. For many of us today in church, the, the church is a place to go on Sunday. It's it's something that, that we have to do. It's something that, 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 that we want to go and be a part of and, and check a block on a Sunday morning. We don't see it for what it is and the church is complicit in giving you and freeing you from a perceived obligation 
So what do we do? I tell you, the leadership of the church, we say, hey, pay me a little bit of money, money that you can already afford so you don't actually have to sacrifice. I'll fly you halfway around the globe. I'll give you some water bottles with some scripture on it to hand out to some complete strangers that you'll never see again in your life. And maybe you can even take some photos with some brown people and you can put it on Facebook and you can show everybody that you've been on mission and then you come home and you can feel good about it yourself. You don't actually have to sacrifice. And oh, by the way, bring me your children. Bring me your children. We'll make disciples of them. We're the professionals. Bring me your youth. And we're the professionals with the youth as well. The surest indicator that that is not working is that that is not working. Yeah. Every single generation falls further away from the church. Every single generation is peeled further and further away from the church. And you know why? Because our children are not fools and they can detect a sham. They can detect a fraud when they see it. When they see the dichotomy between how parents live and what parents say. That's why they fall away. That's why they leave the church in record numbers. Each year, the, the young people leave the church in record numbers as they turn 18 and go out on their own. And it comes down to how do we view our children? How do we view our children? How do we think about our children? Hear me now. Our children are not an obstacle. Our children are not a hindrance. Our children are not something to overcome. Our children are not a nuisance that hinders what I want to accomplish in life. Think about working dual incomes. I'm going to make a generalization here. I'm going to go ahead and make a generalization. Years ago, uh, Amy and I were were short money. We didn't, we didn't have much money and, and we didn't know what to do. And so we put Amy through nursing school. And, and it was the best thing we've ever done because Amy Amy is, is the best nurse I've ever known. She, she is a great nurse. And in fact, she just got home from a 12 hour shift to not last night. And she immediately got work at the hospital. I mean, it's easy to find work as a nurse. And so she was working as a, a nurse in the hospital and I was full-time active duty military. And we had a lot of days that were like this. Hey baby, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick up the kids from, from the babysitters and then I'll, I'll grab a pizza or something and throw it in. I'll throw them in bed real quick. When you get off shift in the morning, could, could you pick them up and take them to the babysitter? And then, then I'll pick them up after me and I'll, talk, I'll, I'll drop a little, little, little Darian off at soccer practice and then I'll then we'll grab some McDonald's and then, then I'll drop them off at the babysitter before. It, strangers. Strangers were raising our children. Absolute strangers were making disciples of our children. And for our family, one of the best decisions we ever made was when we said, what are we doing? This is lunacy. That we would sacrifice time with our children for the sake of what? Standard of living? And you know what? I never, we never actually had any more money than we did before because we were paying a babysitter. We were, I was eating out all the time. I mean, we never actually had any more money. And again, I know that each situation is different. And maybe there is a situation where you would need to have a dual income. But where are our priorities? Where are our priorities? How do we view our children? Are they a hindrance? Are they an obstacle? Are they something to overcome? Men, let me talk to you specifically. Women too, but I'll talk to men. I'll address you. Uh, specifically for just a minute here, what are the things that men focus on? Think about you know being surrounded by army officers and sergeant majors and stuff for the last 20 some years, very focused, very driven individuals, and, and our tendency is to focus upon our vocation, to put our stock into, into what we earn, to how much we earn, our position, our authority, the things that we acquire, how much stuff we have, how big is our house, how many cars do we have, can I have the holy grail the holy grail for men, financial security. Maybe I could even retire early. Wouldn't that be a bonus if we could do that? Think about that. The minute you die, men, everybody, the minute you die, the world will begin the process of forgetting all about you. All about you. Don't believe me? 
Who was the most popular man in Clarksville, Tennessee, the richest man 30 years ago? You don't know. 20 years ago? That man done dead and buried and gone. Forgotten about. The only legacy that we have that endures is the disciples that we make of our children. That's it. How do we view our children? Psalm 127 tells us, and some of you know Psalm 127 well, the psalmist would refute this idea that our children are some sort of barrier or hindrance or nuisance or something to over overcome. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 127 that our children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Well, that implies that there's a war. Well, there's a war. I'm here to tell you that there is a war and God has given us exactly two offensive weapons to fight this war. He has given us the sword of the spirit that is the word of God and he has given us our children, our sons, that they would be like arrows in the hands of a warrior as we fight this war. And so would you put the sword of the spirit that is the word of God into the hands of your sons, into the hands of of your children. This is how we ought to view our children. We ought to see them in this particular light. We ought to see them as the arrows that they are. They're not a nuisance. They're not a hindrance. They're not something to get in the way of what you want to accomplish. We've got to make disciples of our children. They're desperate for it. They're urgent for it. They need us to make disciples of them, to make that a priority in our lives. And so when you think about the two positions that we come before this idea today, that, that maybe you were ignorant of what God's word said about the primacy, the requirement to make disciples of our children. I pray that we have destroyed that today. I pray that we have demolished. I pray that the Holy Spirit has demolished that ignorance in any of our hearts. But I know. I know. I know what the Word of God says. Still I struggle. Why is that? One simple reason I struggle because of sin and selfishness. That is the only reason I struggle. I wake up every day and I say, I want to do this today. I want to do this today. I want to get this done and I want to do this thing over here. And it might even be good things. It might even be ministry. I might be seeking to minister to one of you. But what about when my sons need me? What about when my children need me? What then do I do? And the only thing we can do when we choose poorly is to repent. Repent and turn from that. Say, God, forgive me for not seeing my sons, my children, for what they are as arrows in the hands of a warrior. Forgive me for putting them on the back burner. And, and don't hear me say that we idolize our children. That's a whole different sermon. We don't idolize our children. We put God, spouse, children. But we got, to, we got to make disciples of our children. And so that's my prayer today as we think about being challenged right here in Jerusalem. Right where you are. And again, maybe you don't have children. Yeah, maybe, maybe you will never have children. I don't know. Most people do have children at some point in time. What then will you do? How will you act? How will you conduct yourself as you are being confronted with what God's word says concerning the duty and the obligation for men, fathers, mothers to make disciples of their children? So I'm going to pray. And do you need to repent? Do you need to turn from sin and self where you put the disciple making of your children onto the back burner? There's nothing more important with your time you can do every single day. Let us pray. Lord. God, you